Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. It was a different time when John F. Kennedy said this. Nowadays, the present can become the past in a matter of hours. The fast pace of today's tech makes everything more immediate and expansive. A hashtag takes off on Twitter, and in an instant, it's trending worldwide. Regardless of your personal stance on digital change, your business stance needs to be all in. Brands today have to respond to the changing nature of how people find and connect with companies online. But is it too much? Are you hopelessly stuck playing catch up with the latest design or marketing trend? Or are there deeper principles that aren't affected by change? Foundational values that can help your law firm stay relevant without becoming stagnant? Let's find out. Lawson, the podcast for law firms. Powered by Consult Webs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that leaves you with a minty fresh taste for the rest of the day. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in personal and professional development. I am your co-host, Jake Sanders, and joining us today through a combination of magic, technology, and luck is Paul Julius. What's good with you, Paul? Everything is good with me. Oh, what's on the show today? On the show, we hit the Hot Takes Buffet with an article from Inc.com on how marketing has changed and why it matters. We interview Magnus Simon Arson from Consult Webs. And as always, we put our president and patron on the hot bench for 10 questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The article today is from Inc.com. It's by A.J. Agrawal. It's how marketing has changed and why it matters. Uh, The headline 10 years ago, people went to one or two websites when looking for a product and made a decision based on that information. Today, however, the information available about products is almost endless. What was your take on this, Paul? You know, it's interesting that um, to me, it all came down to the last one. Um, And I don't Maybe we should go. Let's go through the each one. There's there's six points here. Uh, yeah. Number one, always provide value. Number two, use content. Number three, use multiple channels. Number four, use analytics. Number five, look at SEO. And number six, focus on the customer. Um, hmm. To me, I looked at this as kind of a big arrow all pointing down at number six. Focus on the customer. Right. Um, I, don't, I, I don't see any other way that any of this other stuff matters if you're not thinking about that. You know? Totally. Um, it's It's – you can do all the uh, all the different sales techniques you like. You can try and 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 hoodwink people with with you know clever ads or whatever mm-hmm. you want. But uh, you know, ultimately, if you're you know not nowadays, there's just too, there's too many things to compare. You know, you're not going to go and buy one mattress. You're going to look at eight different options you have from six stores that are can either ship to you with the same day or, you know, you can get to in five minutes. It's weird that a lot of this stuff, he's saying this is how marketing has changed, but all of it is almost digital. Like he's talking about SEO and he's talking about multiple channels and he's saying, you know, you got to leverage your social media. But... Does everybody need all those things? Like, and shouldn't you have a strategy on what you're going to say? Because it says you should focus on creating content, but then go back down to the bottom. What does your audience want? Think about them first, then find out what content. And then where does that, the number one, I liked the, the, the first one, which was value. The author says, if you can start a dialogue with your customer, then a sale can follow naturally. But if you're pushing products and stuff, maybe people don't want to start a conversation with a brand of pickles. You know, (laughs) it's like, it's not everybody is eager for conversation, you know? So you, there's a lot of presumptions and preconceptions that need to be kind of filtered out through something that luckily enough, our interview touches on with Magnus. Um, he has kind of like a firm anchor in the idea that you think about the clients and consider everything from their perspective. And then 
retroactively build your marketing strategy. Just look at your client, look at them in the context. What are they doing? How do they behave? Where are they? What do they need? What are their problems? And then draw it back towards how can I be a part of that meaningfully? Yeah. Uh, if a lawyer says, well, we need to be on multiple channels. So they're on Thumbtack, Angie's List, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, LinkedIn, LinkedIn company profile page. They've paid for advertisements on Yelp. How are we serving people? Yeah, definitely. I agree. And and it's interesting too, how, how you could almost, uh, you know, it, it, it's like a, see the, miss the forest because of the trees. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you get caught up like with everything you just said, oh, you know, I, we need Yelp reviews or, you know, we can't, mm -hmm. we need to optimize our website or all this stuff, um, mm -hmm. you know, without focusing on like, well, you know, do, what can I do to make people want to, to come back? You know? <laughs> Sure. Well, or how can I take advantage of it once they show up? You know, you're, yeah, yeah. you're, you're crunching out all these blog posts, but really people just need to know, are you the lawyer for me? Who can I trust? That's not you to tell me to trust you. Yeah. <laughs> and then how can I get in contact with you? You know, like your, your website doesn't need to be this library of extensive um, you know, expertise. These people have zero time. They're in probably really crappy positions in their life. They need to make quick decisions. So they go to your website. Can they see themselves in your marketing? Because the only way they could do that is if you put the client in your marketing. Yes. Yes. That's what I would say. I got nothing to follow that up with. That was beautiful. And now, a word from our sponsor. I met Tanner, who works for Consult Webs, on a plane on the way back from Key West, Florida. And I'd just been thinking that I needed to do some more marketing for my law firm. So when he told me that he worked for Consult Webs, I was super excited. From the beginning till even now, I've been with them for almost two years. And the experience has really been great. Having Consult Webs on board is really like having your own team of people that really care about what kind of business you're getting. I mean, practicing law can seem kind of lonely. You always are wondering, how am I going to get clients? How am I going to make payroll? But with Consult Webs, it's not just me worrying about having people come in the door. They're there as well. And they've been so responsive. Since I started with Consult Webs, I have increased the number of employees double, at least. And since I started with Consult Webs, the revenue has tripled. So it's really been an incredible experience. Go to consultwebs.com to learn more. And now for an awesome interview. Magnus Simon Arson is the president of Consult Webs, a digital marketing company working exclusively with lawyers. Magnus graduated with honors and holds advanced degrees as both a computer programmer and business analyst. As a programmer, Magnus developed several content management systems and also designed travel information kiosks that were located around the world. Magnus joined Consult Webs in 2000 as a programmer when the company had only two employees. Since that time, he has ascended to the position of president, where his responsibilities include providing guidance to teams, managing client partnerships, and implementing the company's business strategies. With a steady diet of online inspiration, Magnus is constantly looking at digital marketing trends and updates to ensure the campaigns of ConsultWeb's clients remain effective and up-to-date. Lucky for us, ConsultWeb's is also the corporate sponsor of this podcast. So in order to keep the lights on, We've invited Magnus to share his thoughts on the podcast he pays for. Magnus, how are you? Doing really well. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this podcast. <laughs> Thanks for paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> We're thrilled. Totally. <laughs> quite, a quite a surprise. <laughs> Jumping right into it, the internet has developed and grown. It's taken many different changes and it's it's altered and transformed so are there any digital marketing fundamentals or principles you've seen that seem to stand the test of time absolutely absolutely when it comes to marketing whether that's back in 99 or now in 2018 if you if you always think about what is the user searching for and if you have that as your guiding 
question that you have to answer every day, your marketing methods, whether that's technical or, or you know, through through the airwaves, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what it is. If you are looking at what the users is 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 looking for, and then you design your strategy around that, that, as far as I'm concerned, is the fundamental thing when it comes to the marketing. So put that in, <clears throat> put that as a priority. What mm-hmm. is the user looking for? Let's gear our message. Let's gear our tactics. Um, let's gear our strategy towards exactly that. So in our space, being that we service lawyers, <clears throat> our clients are the clients that are looking for legal help, right? Mm-hmm. So they're exper- experiencing something traumatic usually. No, typically a someone in, 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 a, in a good position is not looking for illegal help, right? Right. So these are folks that are, are, are in, you know, kind of crappy situations. Um, they're looking for um, help because they experiencing they, they experience something really bad. So mm-hmm. how can we help them uh, find the right lawyer uh, to 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 help them navigate the next few months or, or, or few years of their life? So if we put that as the kind of as the as the fundamental, um, that has always been the message that that we try to go after. In your time since '99 to now, has anything uh, in the digital marketing space caught you by surprise? Yes, <clears throat> I mm. think I think social media caught everybody by surprise. Oh, you know, yeah. way back when, when when MySpace was everyone's favorite, nobody really <laughs> thought of you know how can we use MySpace to attract uh, the marketing message for a law firm, and yeah. even you know when Facebook came along. <clears throat> And, you know, later Google Plus, I think in and around the time when Google Plus became kind of the the thing that that everyone thought was going to be the next social media. I think mm-hmm. at that point, um, you know, marketers started to think, you know, how can we use and leverage social media uh, to 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 put the message out there? However, at the end of the day, everybody wants ROI. Right. Mm-hmm. So when when the social media thing happened, the wrong direction everybody took was how can I make money from Facebook? Mm. And they weren't necessarily thinking about their brand and the strategy and putting the message out there, the community involvement and kind of publicize themselves as a good caring company. It was, it was more, the struggle was more, how can we use social media to make money? And even today, Mm. social media isn't necessarily the best avenue to make money. You know, making money is a byproduct of social media. Mm-hmm. But if you use social media right, you can contact potential clients <clears throat> that, you know, they, they will learn more about the company. You you can show them that you care about the community, that you aren't the typical uh, ambulance chasing type lawyer that, that people sometimes see on, on television. What you're talking about, those basic marketing principles even play here because you're thinking about the way someone uses Facebook – when you're designing a marketing strategy around hitting them in that context. So I think that's pretty fascinating that even these things that seem to crop up and change, uh, transform the landscape, still are working off of these core principles, which I think you outlined perfectly, just thinking from the user's standpoint. And maybe not about making money, but maybe making a, a friend or a connection or something like that. Exactly, and and then next time they need a lawyer, you will you will be in their in their heads already. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, I think yeah. it fits it fits kind of two ways too, because you you mm. can use social media to either um, you know use that user behavior and stuff to to show someone an ad, um, a topical ad at the right time, or mm. it can be used to um, validate them. You know what I mean? Like, like people, mm-hmm. I hear it all the time that people say social media is, you know, the, now it's that, that's the digital over the fence. You know what I mean? Like neighbors don't really talk anymore. It's on social media. So if you want right. to, if you want to look someone up, you're going to look them up on, um, you know, you're going to, you're going to look them up on Facebook or look them up on LinkedIn, you know, to see what kind of Google reviews they have. Um, so it's not necessarily like you may not go in there to interact or you may not be on Facebook and suddenly see an ad and be like, Oh, you know what? That's amazing. I was just in a car accident. How did they know? But you might be looking for a lawyer and you know, okay, so I'm down to three choices. Let me start to see, you know, some different factors here to, um, kind of back up my, my plus or minuses for some of these people. Exactly. 
Exactly. Back in the day when, when, when Twitter kind of blew up, we created a program that would, that would plug into the Twitter API and we would get alerted every time somebody tweeted, you know, keywords like accident, car accident, uh, slip, uh, and those type of things. And we would get alerted and we would know, Hey, somebody was in an accident on, you know, fifth Avenue in, in, in New York. And they tweeted about it. We know who they are. We have their, we have their username. We built a map and a heat map and the, and the whole thing. But it wasn't the it wasn't the message that you need to really use on social media. Now, the last thing you want is to tweet about your car accident and then a lawyer hitting you up saying, "Hey, I, I got a notification you were in a car accident. I'm here if you if you if you help." Right? Yeah, that's not I'm, creepy. Like a right. check in, like someone checks into a hospital and then gets like five calls from different lawyers. <laughs> exactly, and and you know, geofencing is a is a is a good example. We we had some crazy ideas. Our clients have had some crazy ideas geofencing funeral homes you know that that's that's something that, that uh-huh. came up once, right for wrongful death um so social media is a great tool to expose yourself and not necessarily be in everybody's kind of backyard um but you know hey i'm here if you need me rather than hey you you just you just hit a tree uh i'm i heard about it i'm here right right well right. and I, I like the perspective that my space was here for a while and nobody jumped in on this like we're all in on Facebook. Like, I mean, even a dog groomer has a Facebook page now. And that wasn't there. That Like the conception of social media as this marketing kind of trampoline wasn't there. And social media had been there for a while. You could have taken over an uh, instant messenger or AOL kind of thing. I mean, there, there was this uh, infrastructure – but there wasn't this oily <laughs> grabbiness that kind of persists with social media. Exactly. Interesting. To kind of build off that too, and, and, and talking about the oily grabbiness. Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> weird. Know, that's what I'm sorry. <laughs> it's yeah. massage hey, envy. I, you know, I, 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 I go to strange places on this show. What can I say? Um, I've noticed. I know. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the the different approaches you can take uh, with social media, let's kind of build out on that a little bit more. Um, and just in in general, with with more online stuff, we hear about um, the the different ways you can do things: black hat, gray hat, white hat. You know, um, Magnus, you know better. You've seen these things evolve. Could you give us the, kind of the difference in these approaches and kind of give us your opinions on on each approach? Absolutely. So black hat is a, is a word you don't really hear about, not so much anymore. You right. know, back in 2005 up until probably 2012, black hat was a really popular strategy. And black hat is something that a lot of agencies used in this space in particular, because this is, you know, this is one of the more competitive spaces out there. Right. Sure. And the problem we faced many, many times was that, our clients' competitors were using black hat tactics. They were buying links in the bulk that you could never, ever do without joining them. So mm. several times we were faced with the choice of, do we go the black hat route so we can stay competitive or do we do the things the right way? Um, mm. we, took, <clears throat> we took over a client uh, once and the week that we took him over, Google sent us a penalty. So they came from one of our our competitors with a penalty already on them. It Mm. took us about nine months to clean up everything um, because keep in mind, you know, the the, the black hat tactics back then was that you would would get a lot of links from the Philippines, from India, et cetera. And, you know, these weren't just, you know, 15, 20 links. These were links that were maybe 15, 20,000. So you had to, you know, back then do everything manual. Uh, now Google has has a tool where you where you can disqualify some of the links that you that you that you don't want to count. But mm-hmm. you know, back then it, it it was a real struggle. So it took us a good year to to get that client out of the penalty box. Uh, but they never ever recovered their ranking. So yes, you can take uh, and more so back then you can take shortcuts. But in the in the in the long run. They just simply never pay off. So black hat is something that mm. we were never big fans of. The gray hat, that's <laughs> that's more gray, right? Um, <laughs> right. So, but I, but again, you know, none of these, you know, black, gray, or white, none of these things really 
account today because the way that we and and and, and most other agencies do um, SEO is more focusing focusing on the marketing side of things, right? Hmm. Um, let's get articles published, you know, in Forbes, uh, exposing our clients, getting them visibility, getting them obviously, you know, links, uh, but really focusing on what the user is searching for and not worrying so much about what Google is after. One of the, Interesting. one of the biggest, uh, difference between us and, uh, our competitors is that we typically don't worry about Google. It was kind of interesting instilled in me way way back when matt cutts was was involved with 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 uh google you know focus on the user focus on the user don't write content for google don't type the keywords in don't repeat you know car accident lawyer six times in the first paragraph of a, of a, of a page these i mean these are tactics that were used back in the day mm-hmm. now it's more let's focus on what the user is doing let's make sure the articles that we write are well written and that is really the long-term game plan uh does that take more time than 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 shortcuts obviously yes um but the longevity is you want to be in business with the same domain with the same website for 40 years mm-hmm. you want to yeah. you want to keep your website for four months sure we can we can we can do shortcuts but it's the longevity of what we're doing that we build up on mm. just to kind of back up for a second and get a little bit uh definition for maybe people who don't spend a lot of time uh doing online seo optimizing or anything um basically what you're saying is that when google's algorithm was was younger than it is now they would look for certain signals to determine where a result would show up in the search ranks and one of those signals was links from other sites right? Basically the fast way to do it, the black hat, what you're talking about was just, just game it, get links from all over the place. Like nobody in China is going to naturally link to a personal injury lawyer in Raleigh, right? That's just, that's not for real, but it was exploitable and Google has kind of evolved and said, okay, now, now we see that stuff. Um, but I mean, ultimately, you know, aren't they, isn't it really any, any kind of unnatural activity that you do on your part, like purchasing links or, or swapping or anything like that? I mean, that's what we used to call black hat and what you're talking about that we do now that Google says, this is the best way to do it is to focus on, you know, like you were saying, get, get articles, you know, published and stuff like that. That is, that was the white hat. Now that's just kind of standard operating procedure. Exactly. It takes more work to get links from the local community than directories from from other countries, right? Mm. But don't be afraid of putting hard work into what you do because you will benefit from that for many, many, many years. You know, there is a reason why we have clients that have been with us since 2000 and 2001 and 2002 and 2003. It's because we looked at those clients back then and we said, and, and even today when we get new clients, I want these clients to be our clients 20 years from here. And in order for us to maintain that, we have to do things right, right from the start. Sometimes that means slower progress, but nobody cares about a few months when we're thinking about a 20, 30 year lifespan. Is there like a, like some kind of risk reward thing that, that you look at when, when it's probably not done anymore. Um, but people are like, Hey, Look, I don't care. I'm just going to buy, you know, my domain is going to be attorney, you know, four, five, six, and I'm going to, you know, just spam, try and get away with as much as I can. You know, Google's going to hit me with a penalty, which for anybody who wants to know a penalty, it means basically you get de-indexed and you don't show up in the search results. It's just a churn and burn thing. Um, is there, I mean, is there any value in that at all? Like, can you, could, could you ever rationalize that as a business approach? Not if you would have asked this a few years ago, I would probably say yes, um, because there was just not as much that goes it goes into things as they do today. Yes, mm-hmm. you could you could register abclaw.com and just use it for four months for a specific campaign. Just make sure it's never and not once associated to you or your name or your location, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, hide all identities from from anything, so nobody knows from the back end of the side of things, you know, who you are today. 
because the way that search engines uh, operate, where you have to tie your location into your domain, et cetera, uh, I would obviously recommend highly against it. For those kind of short-term campaigns, social media is key. And we've seen in the mass tort space, we've seen how, how powerful social media can be when it comes to ads, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't have to worry about short-term strategy anymore necessarily from, from the search side of things, but more from the ad side of things. And then again, like I said, use social media to, to put your name out there. So when you're talking about social media and the way consumers kind of view and obtain legal services online, things are drastically changing. Um, Avo, LegalZoom, Rocket Lawyer, these companies are changing how people are accessing services. So do you think law firms are adapting to this? Probably not as fast as they should be. Some of these services, you know, primarily focus on, you know, estate planning and stuff, you know, that necessarily Documents. don't. Right. You know, services that don't necessarily lead to a trial, right? And, mm-hmm. Well, unless you use legal, LegalZoom to get a, a business document because you're lending somebody money and then they don't end up paying you, you know, I'm sure you need, at that point, you, you will need a real lawyer and not a self-service right. checkout. Um, yeah. However, LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyers, these are services that any lawyer can easily integrate into their business, right? Um, Interesting. Where, right, where, where they, it's, it's, it's a self-managed service on their site. They have the exposure, they have the brand, and they have the community uh, behind them. So for a local lawyer, you know, in, in Waynesville, North Carolina, he would, in my views, be a lot more competitive than Rocket Lawyer or rocket lawyers and uh, legal sum and, and 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 these type of services, just because the, he has the name and the community behind them, where these national right. services do not. Mm, there's a face there, exactly. And like I said, if if you're if you're doing a business loan document and the person doesn't pay you, then you know the lawyer with that service would probably be the first choice to call back if you know, sorry, if the uh, if the uh, crap hits the fan. Yeah, <laughs> he's Very, just nice. barely avoiding that swear jar, what? Jake. I mean, we're uh, right on the edge, right on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's awesome, and I and I didn't even think that there's a potential for law firms, maybe even a solo or small firm, for them to use these um, shortcuts to make them more competitive, rather than just like complaining that they're eating your lunch. Maybe have them over to your table or something. Exactly. That's exactly. I mean, that's cool. The the local effect is something that national brands never ever will have. Oh yeah. Well, and just like what you're saying, it it takes more effort to get those local links. When I can get a link from some fake place in Australia, you know, easy because they're not worried about it. They're like, I don't want to. I don't want to. Like, I don't want to know. You don't want to know. Here's the link. Get away. Exactly. Um, versus like a real link with someone that's just down the block. That's really, really cool. And, and local links have a higher value uh, because they are local and it, you know, they show that you're not necessarily gaming the system. So put your focus on where you're from. As you've journeyed through the digital landscape, you've mentioned that there are some guiding principles and standards, but what's helped you kind of man the helm as like a president of the organization? Is there, is there something that, Maybe other folks who are um, who have the heavy crown, uh, you know, who have to be the man. Um, are there any kind of principles or standards that have helped you along the way that maybe you could share with us? I and we we've talked about this many many times within our team. Mm. Um, you know, put your customer first, but also think about their customers. So I, I'm kind of repeating what I said here in the beginning, but right. we are we are ser- serving you know folks seeking legal help. We had a client, several clients, who have shared kind of their customer journey with them, you know, what happened in their lives, how they found our clients, and then what our clients did to help improve their lives. And to me, that always speaks volume. And, and when we bring in new team members into our team, uh, when we all get together, we talk about this frequently. You know, our work matters. We're not working for the ambulance chasing attorney. Mm. When people hear, uh, you know, who's your customer? Well, our customers are our law firms. You know, you there is a stigma of, oh, okay, definitely. But 
who are we serving? And if we put that first, and if we put that as the guiding principle, that our people, the people that we are helping are the people who have been into accidents and they need help. That to me has helped me guide myself, you know, through the day-to-day activities and really think about, you know, what, what is it, you know, does our work matter? And this was, this was a struggle for a very long time. Does our work matter? Mm. And when we started talking to our clients and we started talking to their clients, we invited, we, we, in, in one of our, the conferences that we, that we held with our entire team, we invited several clients of our clients to come and talk to us. And everyone realized that our work actually matters. So that is really the, the journey that, that we see, right? We are actually doing meaningful work. And because of our work, lives are being improved through our clients. That's great. Well, and that it isn't just a saying that you're actually talking and then making sure and checking in with um, the people that are on client side um, that are doing these things that are upholding these standards. Cause it's really, it's not about the, the principles. It's actually the follow up on the principles. Maybe, you know, exactly. Absolutely. So to, Take that question kind of one step further and maybe a little more personal, moving away from the, the internet side of things, the, the, the client side, um, you help consult webs grow from a company of two to now over 50 people. How did you promote that kind of growth, even through some of extremely difficult economic times? Mm. That's a good question. So I joined console webs in, in, in 2000, uh, as a, as a programmer. When you were, um, when you were 18. <laughs> <laughs> about that age yes <laughs> um and we happened to have a product that was good we happened to have a stellar service and we really took care of our clients so the guiding principle is always what is best for our clients put our clients number one when we make big decisions and and i know my team loves this question when we're either you know spitballing through voice or going through emails, I often tend to ask the question, is this really the best for our client? And we have to always put that number one. Mm. You know, we, we've been in business for almost 20 years. Um, we have over 50 full-time team members. We also have roughly about 30 uh, contractors. And all of that has happened because we really focus on what is best for our clients. What about advice that you've received? Um, did you get any advice or training along the way that's contributed to, you know, where you're at? Or what about some kind of harder moments where you had to kind of face the truth and, and kind of deal with the rough stuff? It's a great question. Um, back in 2013, I hired a business trainer. And I meet with him regularly uh, hmm. every month to discuss some of the things that we are faced with having a business uh, trainer and also being a member of a mastermind group where I meet with them uh, once a week mm. has been an absolute game changer. One of the best advice that I, I received from, from, uh, from my mentor was your team is not here to make you successful magnets. You are here to make them successful. Mm. And every manager in our, in our, in our business knows this. Your job is to make your team successful. They're not here for you. You're here for them. And when he said that, and he's only said that once, and this was back in 2013, and I still remember this, it, it was an absolute game changer for me in the, the, the way that I thought of our team. Well, it, it also kind of changes the stress level because um, as a manager, you're like, look, it's my ass on the line. If you guys mess this up, I'm the one who's going to have to pay for it because that's on the other side of like not success or not building people, not making things look good. Like you're making me look bad. Right. Um, I think that's an interesting corollary that it helps kind of diffuse um, maybe some animosity too that's in the ranks, you know, yeah. that maybe you can show up for your friend because you're not competing with them for adulation or something. It's like it's it's about the client first. So maybe me and you can work on this for them. Um, it's an it's an it's really powerful 
if you can keep bringing it back. And I'm glad that that guy didn't tell you that same piece of advice over and over. You're like, yeah, you told me last week. And they're like, Magnus, come here. I want to I wanna share something with you. Like, does this guy have amnesia? Or like, what's going on? It's like spiritual, inspirational amnesia. <laughs> you know? You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still changing my game. Thank you. Um, but how? what about mastermind groups? What about being in a group of people? Um, is it just because they hold you accountable for the BS? Or is there something about kind of following along with someone else's problems that can help you figure it out? What's the best, uh, just the mastermind group itself? What What are the aspects of that that you like? So the mastermind group I'm in, we actually call ourselves an accountability group because I have no issue of holding my team accountable, but who holds me accountable? Right. Right. God. And, <laughs> right. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, you know, a lot of business owners or, or, or CEOs, presidents, et cetera, they struggle with, you know, their own accountability. So we have an accountability group that meets weekly where we talk about and discuss what are our business goals and we hold each other accountable. Another uh, piece of that is you have an, you know, access to other 10 businesses who are not in this space, mm-hmm. but they can give you a complete different perspective on the issues that you are facing. Cool. You can obviously work with your, your leadership team, but they are in your business, right? Sometimes it's good just to step outside of that explain what the issue is to an outsider and they will give you a completely new perspective on what's going on and how to deal with that. And you learn from other people's mistakes as well through all of that. And you can also help, you know, the others guide, guide them through, through some of the, some of their issues because you've, you've experienced that yourself. Going back to consult webs and, and legal marketing, kind of the greatest hits, what's the best thing or most important, impactful and effective thing you've ever seen a law firm do in regards to marketing? So there's two things that really come to mind. Um, I was visiting a client once and his uh, lobby was full of people, full of people. And I was waiting for my client to show up. He came into the lobby and you could see and you could sense the care that he had for, for their clients. He shook everybody's hand. He introduced him to himself to everybody. He assured them that somebody would, would be taking great care of them. He gave, gave them his business card. You know, if, if you have any questions, I'm here. And just being kind like that has such a, a tremendous impact on the future. Because here you are looking, you know, waiting on a lawyer in, in his lobby. The owner of the company shows up, shakes your hand, gives, him, gives you his card. To what law firm are you going to refer your friends to after a treatment like that? You're gonna, you're, you're, that is an instant love between the client and the lawyer. Experience is marketing. I just wrote that down because a lot of people are kind of wondering, oh, what kind of tactics or should we have a viral video or should I, you know, adopt a dog or what? And really a concerted handshake, looking someone directly in the eye And just being a human is maybe one of the most powerful things. And notice that coming from the digital marketing guy, nothing replaces these handshakes. Nothing nothing replaces this local trust. And you nailed it. You nailed it when you said, by being human. Wow. And I I stood there. I thought to myself, hmm, my mother would ever need a lawyer. I no doubt would send her to see this. Uh, law firm, just because how they treat their customers. The other example, and that's more in in, in line, you know, what we do day to day. So we had, I sure. um, still have a divorce lawyer uh, here in Raleigh, who um, wanted to be a little different from the rest of the uh, law firms out there. And uh, he came to us, and we were brainstorming: what can we do to kind of put you out there, right? How about you focus on one cause that matters? So we created a whole campaign called Fraternities for Families, where he ran a, an organization for, you know, basically was uh, fraternities against uh, abuse. Hmm. This got him media exposure, 
uh, and we talked about links earlier, got him uh, both little links. Uh, so we actually did see direct impact on on just organic rankings. Uh, mm. And this is this is a cost that he has been running since I believe it's been to, since 2012, 13. And every year there is media exposure where he goes back out there. And this is it's funny because he generally cares. This is not a fake kind of uh, <laughs> important <laughs> distinction there. Right, right. Uh, you know, he's doing this because he wants to do it, not because he's going, hey, how can I how can I get more business? Mm. Right. It was more, you know, this is really a cause that I care care about deeply. Uh, so let's use my law office and let's get, obviously, some exposure. Uh, but it's something that, that he really, really, really cared about. And it, it's worked really well. It's worked really well. Well, and I think you, you, you know, the, the way you set that up too, where, where, you know, you were talking about the client going into his office and shaking hands and then onto this larger campaign. But it's still the same thing. Like you, you can't, people know when you're faking. You know, it's just oh, like, yeah. the, and, and, and I think if, if he wasn't invested in this, like, this is something he would do. Like, even if it had nothing to do with marketing or us or anything, like he's the kind of guy who would just go and help out people who needed help. And this was just a larger way to do it. You know what I mean? So, um, there's, there's that, like we said, that humanity, like being genuine, being involved, doing things for other people, you can kind of take it from the lobby of your law firm. And if you're smart about it, you can kind of spin it up into something else without being, you know, what do we say Gee. earlier, Jake? Greasy? Yeah, snaky and yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> grabby. Yes. Thinking about authenticity and maybe being a good person is a secret towards success. Um, marketing is experience. What bad experiences have you seen? Like what bad examples of marketing have you been a part of? Um, just what, what comes to mind? Never been a part of a bad experience, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Only learning opportunities. So but, that's what I meant. It was, it was split <laughs> testing. There you go. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so actually – and we were not a part of this, but I, I, I do want to mention this. You all probably remember the Jamie Casino uh, Super Bowl TV commercial. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Super choice. <laughs> right. And because you were mentioning uh, viral videos and that mm -hmm. went viral. So let's not talk about the ad. Let's not talk about the execution or the thought behind the actual ad. But let's talk about the execution after the ad. Here was a great opportunity for a lawyer in Georgia to get great national exposure, which, which, which he did. But it was about maybe a week. You know, everybody knew Jamie Casino for about a week, and then he was forgotten. The biggest mistake they did on the execution was to link to a YouTube video. So YouTube got all the links from all the media when he could have gotten the links himself, and he would be set for a very long time with oh. a really cool i would kill to get a link profile like that from cnn from abc from nbc uh from forbes from from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of link sources but they made the drastic mistake of uploading that that video to youtube and then obviously using his website to 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 stream it from from youtube when he should have just had one source and that was his own website i've I've yet to come across a bigger failure than that. Oh, that's so cool. Cause, but that story sticks out in legal advertising as a success. Everyone's like, man, everyone knows. Everybody knows I'm sharing that. And meanwhile, they're just getting YouTube all those clicks and links. From the longevity side of things, if he would have gotten those links himself and not YouTube, he would have been, he would have been killing it right now. Wow. That's amazing. That is worth the price of admission right there, kids. Um, so, Magnus, you're dropping these gems. Is, is there just one singular gem? Like if our listeners could take away one simple thing they could do right now that could make a difference for them in their law firm marketing, um, just kind of one little piece, what, what, do you, what would you want to tell them? Focus on your customer. Number one, two, and three, focus on your customer. Treat them like they are your first and also your last customer. To me, that, that is the biggest thing. 
put them, they don't have to be right. The, the customer doesn't always have to be right, but they have to be respected. So we, it's, it's engraved on us, the customer is always right. But that usually, or, or sometimes isn't always the case, but they have to be respected. So if a customer to, comes to me and says, Magnus, I want, you know, I want to buy 15,000 links. Well, the customer is not right, but he's paying us. So we have to respect him as our customer and we have to guide him and steer him into a, 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 a better investment opportunity, right? Same for a law firm. Put your customer number one. Have them experience a service that they would ne not experience from anybody else. And if you're a business owner, focus on your team. Put your team number one. This, these are the folks that work their butt off to be a part of a successful company. So do what you need to do to protect them, to make sure that they advance, give them opportunities for promotions, and put them first. They, you are here to make them successful, so make them successful. So those are three answers to, to a singular question. <laughs> no, but you know what? It's so bizarre to think that none of it was SEO. None of it was like linking, you know, plugging in your, you know, USB. It makes sense that from your programmer roots and all the way through riding all of these ups and downs, um, you know, through the internet and dancing to Google's tune or, you know, there's been a consistency through this that it's about the user and it's about kind of these relationships and these offline things that strengthen what happens online. And you could have easily said, you know, my one piece of advice is to hire consult webs or, you know, but it was something that's more meaningful that, that people can use that can change how they think of themselves. So it's just no shock that, when we come to these kind of conversations that they reduce themselves down to these very simplistic human, um, just kind of like duh moments. And it's interesting too, that, that Google is following the same path that Magnus has been talking about. If you think about it, because now look at it, you've got the Google, the assistant, you know, it's trying to help you out in all these different aspects of your life. It mm. talks to you. It tries to predict what you're going to need. You know what I mean? Like it's actually trying to humanize as well. Like they've they've realized like that's that's the key. There's this this interaction, this humanity um, that that makes um, you know one search engine different than another, or one law firm different than another. You know, you will not need consult webs if you cannot take good care of your clients. Yeah, that's a Mike, bumper sticker. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> So, Magnus, wrapping it all up, man, how can people learn more about you? I'm, so, so I'm not huge on social media. Um, I primarily use Facebook um, to read about news. Um, two, two main things is, is SEO and, and, and management, industry news, and then, you know, other hobbies that I have. So I think LinkedIn probably would be the best way to get in touch and or obviously our website, consultwebs.com. 10 questions we ask everyone. All right, Magnus, strap in. It's time for 10 questions we ask everyone. Woo! Woo! Number one, what was the last book you read? You guys had CDs in your car, so you're my age, right? Oh, yeah. I never knew the knew the knew the name of the song I was listening to, but I knew that it was on "Use Your Illusions" number two, song number five, right? right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you read book number four, <laughs> right? So, with stupid Kindle, there is no okay. Ask that again. Uh, what was the last book you read? A book called Traction. Number two. What's your best habit? You know, I've heard your podcast many times, Paul, and I'm struggling here. So uh, another pause moment. <laughs> what is my best habit? Learning. Always wanting to learn something new and always trying to improve what I am doing as a person and what we're doing as a business. Number three, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, or none of the above? Mm, good question. So I use Snapchat to be in touch with my family back in Iceland. And uh, that has been a game changer just in, in terms of how we communicate. Uh, and I use Facebook to keep, instead of visiting, you know, CNN, stuff like that, 
I use Facebook to really shift through all the all the noise and really you know focus on what my interests are and what I what I need to study. So Facebook would be probably number one. Okay. Number four, coffee or tea? What's tea? My man, that's the correct <laughs> answer. Number five, I drink. I I drink excessive amount of coffee, and I love coffee. And I'm a big fan of coffee, and I wish everybody would drink more coffee. <laughs> that is such a coffee drinker <laughs> answer right there. <laughs> yeah, that's the and most we need more coffee of it. drinker fact, right now. <laughs> I'm holding on to my desk. Um, <laughs> number five, what is your favorite place? My favorite place is a small town in Iceland called Akureyri. And that's where I grew up and that's where I lived for the first 20 years of my life. That is my go-to place when I just need to chill out and think about something. It's, it's probably one of the more beautiful places on this earth. Number six, is Keanu Reeves a good actor? Abs- I, am, I am so blown away by people who say no to that question. <laughs> so are we, man. Have they not seen The Matrix? Um, so that's going to be an emphatic yes. Number seven, what was your first job? So my first job was uh, my parents thought it was a great idea when I was six years old to ship me to a farm every summer. So that you would think that, OK, you just hang out at a farm, but you were actually put to work. So I, I guess shoveling uh, crap uh, was my first job. My, <laughs> my, my, my first paying job was when I was 14 and I got a, I got a job over the summer in my grandfather's factory that did a lot of processing fish related products like shrimp herring uh and things of that nature number eight what is a skill you have outside of your current occupation that you incorporate into your work dude i i this is no joke i am a certified salt fish inspector but i don't necessarily incorporate the inspection of that into my into my <laughs> current role well, <laughs> always trying to improve and always trying to learn Always trying to think of ways that we can do things better. Okay. Number nine, what sites, blogs, or newsletters do you regularly check in with? So again, I, I, I primarily use Facebook uh, and the groups that I am on Facebook to kind of shift through all the noise. Um, Facebook and, and Twitter, I got different feeds on Twitter that, that, that you know, show me what I need to see and, 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 and keep me informed. Okay. Uh, number 10, you've been working at this company for a long time. You've seen a lot of people come and go, um, out of everyone you've worked with, who was the most inspirational and why is it Paul Julius? So the answer is Paul. (laughs) It's not necessarily because he's the host of this podcast (laughs) and I feel obligated to say Paul because I could say Jake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right hold on here's the real number 10 <laughs> I'm sorry i couldn't say that that. One. <clears throat> number 10 after a long day or long week at work how do you relax and unwind i want you to think of the least romantic way that i'm talking right now but i really enjoy taking a really long steaming hot bath at night and laying in the bathtub, listening to music, no, 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 no rose petals or, or, or candles. That really helps me to super relax and read something that I enjoy or listening to something or watch something. For show notes, links, and info, go to www.consultwebs.com slash Lawson Podcast. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay awesome.